Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Business for America uh, webinar, a conversation with Vermont Secretary of State uh, Jim Condos about election transparency and election security. Uh, I am Dan Barlow. I'm the public policy manager of Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. We are a statewide business organization here in Vermont. I uh, work with the Secretary of State's office frequently on a host of business issues and uh, pleased to partner with uh, Business for America on this important issue. And uh, we about an hour long webinar for you today. Uh, the main part of the webinar will be hearing from uh, Secretary of State uh, Jim Condos uh, about what's happening both in Vermont and also more importantly on the national level around these issues. But I wanted to first talk a little bit about why businesses care about elections. Uh, we know that uh, a well-functioning government is essential for a strong and sustainable business climate. And uh, the elections are really the backbone of this system. And across the country, we see attacks on our election system from foreign governments to potential hacking uh, to the purging of eligible voter rolls. Um, just this week in Georgia, we heard about an attempt to block 53,000 predominantly African-American voters from participating in the elections uh, in November. Um, but we believe that election reforms are nonpartisan. VBSR and Businesses for America believe we can coalesce around common goals and find ways to ensure that our elections are safe, accessible, uh, and transparent. Uh, and now I want to turn uh, uh, over to Ashley Moore, the State Director for uh, uh, the Main Street Alliance of Vermont. Thanks, Dan. So, hi, everybody. My name is Ashley. I'm the State Director for the Main Street Alliance of Vermont. We're a statewide organization that works with small business owners. We have about 650 members statewide and we really work to elevate the voices of small business owners on important public policy issues. We've um, worked in partnership with the Secretary of State's office and our national partners on strengthening um, voter registration systems in Vermont and making sure that we really have the strongest systems um, in order to ensure that people can access their democracy. And we really believe that um, access to democracy is critical to ensuring that we have healthy economies and healthy small business uh, communities across the state. And so um, we're really happy to be asked to be part of this webinar. And thank you, Dan. Okay, um, thank you, Ashley. And next, I'm gonna turn over to uh, Sarah Bonk from Business for America. But um, So the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Thanks to Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility and the Main Street Alliance of Vermont for partnering on this. We are excited to talk about secure elections and why it matters to the business community. Uh, real quickly, a little bit about me. So I actually, back in college, studied public policy. I was really excited about the idea of making the world a better place by making government function better. And was studying like systems and processes and organizations and how can you craft those systems to get better results. And after interning in DC for a summer, I recognized that government was not for me, politics is not for me, and really not even think tanking was kind of where it was at for me. I was excited about innovation and change and uh, making the world a better place and actually ended up in the private sector and doing that same kind of work in the business community. So I spent about 20 years in my professional career, um, was uh, in the technology and design sector for the most part, but my roles there focused around systems and processes and organizations and building teams and making things work better and getting better results. So while I was at Apple, my last, uh, my last uh, private sector career, um, I was at Apple and decided I wanted to spend more of my spare time helping to make the world a better place. And I started exploring how to do that. And I just kept coming back to the way that the dysfunctions in our government are inhibiting progress on so many issues. And if we could just address this root issue of our representative democracy and how it's functioning, or not functioning really, um, that we could have better outcomes for all Americans. And as I was doing this volunteer work, I noticed that the business voice was missing in large part. And I just thought there's such a strong economic argument to be made here, and I wasn't hearing enough of that. So I explored, I talked to lots of people about like who's trying to do this work. And one day I realized that I was gonna have to do it myself. So um, in having those conversations, you know, uh, Dan and Ashley alluded to this quite a bit. Why does business care about democracy? Uh, what, what, how our republic functions, how our elections are run. And it's kind of, uh, uh, there's an indirect uh, correlation here, but of course, 
a well-functioning government is able to craft better public policies and regulations that impact businesses directly. Of course, that's things like your health care, taxes, wages, but it could even be you know, the licenses you need to do your job and the other regulations that you face on a day-to-day -day basis. So businesses have an individual stake in how government functions. Beyond that, take it a step, um, step beyond that to a more macro level and looking at the entire business sector and our overall economy. It's pretty clear there the huge role, this outsized role that our government has in how our economy uh, succeeds or doesn't succeed, right? A lifting tide, uh, rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. So um, you may have heard of this already, but the Harvard Business School, uh, they do an annual report on competitiveness. And in 2016 and 2017, they found that dysfunctional government is the number one issue harming America's economic interests and competitiveness. That's pretty telling. Um, so they, they're making the argument for us there that uh, this is a critical issue uh, if we want to have a, a more robust economy. And getting even more macro beyond that, uh, this is an issue that affects every American. Every American. So, this isn't just about our own individual business interests or how the economy flourishes or doesn't. It's about how we move forward together as a country. So we care about our employees, our customers, and our neighbors. And when we recognize the way that government is uh, not achieving the outcomes that we need to achieve, it's pretty clear this is a, a real problem that we need to address. The time we spend on arguing about these things and, and not making progress, it's, it's really hindering us from solving a lot of issues facing this country. So with that, let me actually bring up a couple slides here real quick. So there you go. That is the reason I decided to found Business for America. And we launched last year, and this year really got going with a lot of interesting initiatives I'll tell you a little about. So our mission is to catalyze the business community to advocate for public policy and technology that will strengthen representative democracy, ensure election integrity, and modernize our government. When I tell people about the mission of Business for Democracy, a lot of times people say, well, that's great, and I'm really glad you're doing that, but I don't think it can be fixed. And what I hope people come away uh, from this webinar thinking is, not only is it possible to solve these problems, we actually already have the solutions. We just need to generate the political will to get them into place. And that's the job of Business for America. So, among those solutions, we're talking about how we run our elections, election integrity uh, via security and audits like we're talking about today, but there's a broader issue of access and participation and having a real um, a representative democracy where everybody has a voice. Um, election competitiveness is another issue and ensuring that we avoid gerrymandering and districts are drawn in a more fair manner, open primaries, ranked choice voting. There's a lot of um, a lot of ideas there that some of which are, are pretty new, like ranked choice voting isn't used in a lot of places. It can make a huge difference in the outcome of our elections, including reducing partisanship and toxicity that we see today. We also need to address the issue of money and politics, um, ethics and conflicts of interest and accountability in government. And lastly, of course, modernizing our government with latest technology so we can get better outcomes at a lower cost. Our idea of how we create change as business leaders, we're going to mobilize and educate business leaders to take action. This isn't about think tanking and just talking about the problem. This is taking meaningful steps to put pressure on our elected leaders, our lawmakers, to ensure that we're making progress on these issues. Business for America is partnering with advocacy and business groups across the country and finding where we've got an opportunity to leverage the business community and create that extra weight uh, put, sort of put our finger on the scales and ensure that we get the, get the policies in place that we need to. Our work is taking place at the federal, state, and local level. Our main initiative right now is the Secure Elections Act at the federal level, but we're really excited to start getting some state initiatives going. Um, there's so much work to do there, and with 50 laboratories of democracy, uh, we're going to need to have uh, people, people ready to work for us in all 50 states. And lastly, we want to change the debate, and we have a thought leadership role here to play in talking about the economy, talking about representative democracy, and how those two pieces fit together. That if we really do want to continue to be a leading economy, we really need to sort out these issues that we're facing with our government. So with that, um, let me see. Um, 
So with that, I want to talk really quickly about the Secure Elections Act. Um, Jim's going to get into a lot of detail, but I wanted to talk about why we chose to get involved on that issue. Uh, first of all, it's so topical. After the 2016 elections, uh, more Americans are concerned than ever about the state of our elections and tr trust in our institutions is at an all time low. So uh, this bill is a really terrific bill in that it's bipartisan. When it was introduced in the Senate, they've been making a point to introduce co-sponsors in Democrat-Republican pairs, left-right pairs, as they go, and showing that this doesn't have to be a partisan issue. It's a national security issue. Um, it's a human issue. So it's also very, very practical and common sense. So this is a great place for the business community to get engaged. There is some hesitance, understandably so, for the business community to in get involved on these kinds of issues. Uh, it feels political, it's a little scary. So this bill is so commonsensical and bipartisan, thought it was the perfect place and topical. It's the perfect place to, for us to start digging in and uh, figuring out how to get the business community on board across sectors and all sizes of businesses. We all care about um, creating a better country and moving forward together, and this bill will help it get us there. So. Uh, that's what I wanted to cover right now. So I'm gonna hand it back to you, Dan. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, in a, just a minute, we'll be moving over to uh, Secretary of State Jim Condos uh, for his viewpoints. Um, but I just wanna say a few words about uh, uh, Secretary Condos. Um, you know, here in Vermont, he's really seen as a leader in an increasing election security and accessibility. Uh, he has a track record of increasing voter participation in elections. Uh, here in Vermont, he's championed automatic voter registration, same-day voter registration, online voter registration. Really, you don't have an excuse anymore not to be registered to vote. Uh, <laughs> and here in Vermont, he's creating models for other states to use that they can increase their election participation. Uh, he's been Secretary of State in Vermont for eight years, on the ballot again this November. Uh, before Secretary of State, he was uh, uh, known as a very hard working state senator who often reached across party lines uh, to find common ground. Just this year, he was appointed as president of the National Association of Secretaries of State, and we are proud to have him as our Secretary of State here in Vermont. Uh, Jim Condos, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, this topic really couldn't be more timely considering that we have an election in about three and a half weeks. Um, I, I want to thank the folks at Business for America, Sarah and Richard, Sarah, I do want to say your mission and your solutions are right up my alley. It's the, those are the things that I've been pushing for many, many years. Uh, and, and I also want to thank Dan at BBSR and, and uh, um, Ashley at Main Street Alliance for joining us. And I, I thank you both for your ongoing support and, and our cooperation and working together uh, to pass good legislation. Uh, as Dan said, I am Jim Condos. I am the Secretary of State for Vermont. He, he, detailed a little bit about my political side, my public sector side, but let me just give you a quick background on, on my uh, private sector. I worked for 17 years for a Fortune 100 company uh, covering, I was a manufacturer's rep covering the, the uh, states of Vermont, parts of Massachusetts and New York. Uh, and then I went to work for a short time with uh, a uh, family owned $30 million distribution company before I work for a regulated utility. So I'm pretty familiar with not only the state of Vermont, but also with business practices. Uh, currently, I am the president of the National Association of Secretaries of State. It's a nonpartisan, it's the oldest nonpartisan organization of state officials and is a membership organization. Uh, I believe we have all 48 out of the 50 states plus six territories uh, that are members. And as such, there are positions that NAS takes we call it NAS for short. Uh, there are positions that NAS takes that are uh, what the, that we have to be careful because you can't always get red states and blue states to agree on everything. So uh, one thing I will talk about though as we go is the Secure Elections Act. Um, so at, at times, I, I, I guess I, I just want to say that voting in our elections process are re really the very bedrock of our democracy. Let me just say the secretaries of states across this country are now focused diligently and have been since 2016 on, on protecting the integrity of our elections from foreign adversaries and cyber bad actors. Our world changed in 2016, in August of 2016, when we were asked to be on a conference call with the Department of Homeland Security. DHS notified us then that 21 states had been attacked and that one state had actually been breached. They couldn't tell us at that time 
which 21 states. Um, since then, cybersecurity has really taken up all the air in the room. Uh, we've been focused on pretty much nothing but. And just to give you an example, one month before that conference call with Department of Homeland Security, we had our annual summer meeting. Uh, and in that meeting, there was almost zero discussion about cybersecurity. Today, we just had a meeting this, this past summer. Uh, we also have a, a, a winter meeting in DC in, in February. Both of those meetings, 75% of our meeting uh, schedule has been about cybersecurity. Um, it's, it's really am amazing to me how this has become such a hot topic for all of us. I think it's, it's really, when you think about cybersecurity, you have to look at it this way. Cybersecurity is like a race without a finish line. It's just ongoing and will be for the foreseeable future. This is now our new normal. Um, and, and I think that we have to recognize that going back to you, our businesses, and what the role is that you play in our democratic process. It's not just as secure cybersecurity vendors, but also as community partners and advocates. Uh, as I said earlier, we've worked closely with Dan and Ashley uh, in, in the state house when we're, when we're talking about different things. For instance, automatic voter registration was something, and, and I'm particularly proud of the automatic voter registration uh, uh, legislation that went through. We had three votes, two in the House and one in the Senate that were roll call votes. And out of approximately 300 votes that were cast, there was only one no vote. And that no vote was actually nothing to do with the bill itself. It had to do with something else. Um, <clears throat> in any case, who we elect, what laws and policies we pass impacts all of us. To a degree, our business community does play a role in the health of our democratic process. We need to turn back to cybersecurity, and today I want to cover three things before opening it up to questions. The current national landscape and the discussions that are occurring, what we are doing here in Vermont to protect our elections, and the voting rights and voter access areas to make sure that, making sure that the right to vote is protected for all eligible voters even though folk, the focus right now is on cyber, this health also has to be part of that conversation. So going back to when DHS called us and told us that 21 election systems had attacked, there was one state that was breached. What they failed, what the focus by the media was not on the, the 20 states that defended, but it was on the one state that got breached. Uh, and, and as I keep telling people, the, the 20 states that were not breached actually defended, defended well, did their jobs, but that's, that gets lost in the, in the conversation. The point is we were doing in pretty good shape back then. We're in much better shape today in 2018. Before I dive into how we protect our elections here in Vermont, I want you to know this. There is no such thing as being too well prepared. We can always and must always do better. As I said earlier, this is a race without a finish line. If, if what the bad actors tried yesterday didn't work, they'll try a different way today and again tomorrow. They're constantly evolving and we must be constantly evolving as well. We have to try to stay one step ahead. Back in November two, uh, 2017, I did contact Vermont U.S. Senator Patrick Leahy uh, regarding some leftover hanging Chad money from the 2002 election, uh, 2002 legislation for Help America Vote. He, uh, the original bill in 2002 uh, had approved $3.9 billion uh, and all but $390 million of it had been appropriated. So I asked uh, Senator Leahy to see what he could do about releasing that money as quickly as possible. Uh, and we were successful and in, in, he was successful in getting his uh, members to support him in, in releasing that $380 million that we received in May and June. Vermont, just to give you a perspective, Vermont's share of that 380 million was three, was 3 million. California's, for example, was 34 million. It's all based on, on the size of the states. Uh, but the, the, the important thing to remember here is getting a lump sum every 10 to 15 years is helpful, but it doesn't help us meet the ongoing challenges. Cybersecurity is not once one and done. We have to have sustainable funding going forward. It's the only way that makes fiscal sense. Uh, deferred maintenance, as many of the businesses on this, on this webinar will know, costs more when you 
when you, the more you defer it, the more it costs. And, and I think in the long run, it's better if we have some ongoing sustainable funding. With regard to the S Secure Elections Act, I have been and remain a supporter. I testified in March before the U.S. Senate Intel Committee and again in June before the Senate Rules Committee. Uh, and in both of those instances, I told them that I supported the bill. Um, I've also worked with Senator Amy Klobuchar on addressing some of the areas of concern. She's one of the lead sponsors along with Senator Lankford. Um, and I told her there were a few concerns, but we. I remain committed to getting this bill across the finish line. Um, I did strongly object to uh, the, the political partisan bickering, which I should have saw coming and I didn't. Uh, when, I, when I raised a few concerns of the bill as it was, uh, had been amended, uh, and, and uh, it appeared that I was being thrown out under the bus to be used as a uh, shield for the partisan, partisan bickering that was going on in Congress, especially, it was especially uh, disappointing when we found out later that it wasn't my concerns that, that put a block to the bill, it was actually the White House that put a block to the bill. Uh, and that was a real concern. But having said that, I will say that I'm committed to working with committee members to address areas of concerns as we move SEA to the passage, to passage. And I think that it's important that we remember Election sh security should be a top priority of Congress. Games of political chess that interfere with our ability to work together ensures the, and ensure the security of our elections is really an affront to our democracy. This needs to be a priority. Even if, it's passed, even if it was passed months ago, it really wouldn't have had a whole lot of impact on 2018 just because of how procurement works. And, and these things do take time, for instance, there's been a lot of criticism of some of the states who, who are still using DREs, which I, by the way, do not support. Uh, but that's the equipment that they have, and they have to work with what they have. Um, it's not like walking into Best Buy and saying, oh, I want 200 of these off the shelf uh, and, and going back and starting up. So we need to focus on, on how the, what states need for resources to best support us. Uh, and, and, and specifically for 2020 and beyond. We can't wait until the end of the summer before the election to, to solve the problem. But let's bring us back to now as we approach this November. I can speak on a number of specific best practices that I consider uh, best practices for any state, but uh, I have to tell you that this I'm speaking on behalf of Vermont. So the first and foremost on my, from my individual perspective and most importantly, paper, ballots. A voter marked every vote for every vote that's cast, uh, even for accessible voting system that marks an actual ballot, makes the most sense. It seems simple, it's not very technological, but a paper ballot is the best protection we can have in place. Why? Well, that brings us to the second practice that I consider to be a best practice, and that's post-election audits. Paper, paper can actually be audited for accuracy. Uh, a a touchscreen technology, there's no real way of, of auditing that. Uh, Vermont has been conducting post-election audits every general election since 2006. Dan, I think you remember that from your previous life as a reporter, uh, but uh, in any case, we've been doing it since 2006 and never found a discrepancy. Our process is always open to the public and we have a high statistical confidence level as a result. Our Vermont tabulators uh, that we use are optical scanners all they do is read the ballot and tally that, that, that readout. Uh, it, the best practice which we maintain is that no tabulator is connected to any other tabulator and, the, and there, no tabulator is connected either by Wi-Fi or hardwired to the internet. We have a strong chain of custody for the memory cards that are used. Uh, the clerks do not receive those memory cards until about two to three weeks before the, the election. And at a certain point, they do a logic and accuracy test. And then they make sure that it's zeroed out on, on election day morning. Um, in order for someone to actually hack a tabulator, here's what would have to happen here in Vermont. Someone would need to break into the town office, break into the town clerk's office, break into the town clerk's vault, find the memory card, reprogram it, return the card, and then do all of this without raising any suspicion. And since any one of our polling places is only about 4,000 voters, 
It would take an army of, of men of men and women to break in to do all this. It just isn't feasible to do it. It would be incredibly hard to do. Uh, and, and since we're not connected to the internet from that standpoint, I'd say it'd be nearly impossible to do any kind of large scale uh, attack across the state. Considering that, that's the strength of our US election system. It is that it is decentralized. It's not focused in one area. We have 50 states that manage those elections. Uh, and from there, go flows down to counties and, and towns. Here in Vermont, we don't have county government. So we go right, right from the uh, uh, state level to the town level. We have 246 towns and about 275 polling districts. Since 2016, communications between the federal and state partners has improved tremendously. We now have what we call, as, as a member of the, as being a, elections being de delegated or designated a critical infrastructure, we now have an election infrastructure, ISAC. ISAC stands for Information Sharing Analysis Center. Uh, it's basically a communication protocol and we receive updates on a regular basis, weekly basis. Uh, security clearances have been issued to uh, secretaries of state and some of the staff. Uh, we definitely have a clear channel of communication and we've set up communication protocols. We also have uh, every secretary of state is connected to an election day dashboard. That dashboard is the result of Department of Homeland Security and the FBI and gives us real time updates of what's happening elsewhere in the country so we can be aware and, and, and act if we need to. Like I said, back to, we started it back in, 19, in 2013. Vermont has always been focused on election cybersecurity, so we were a bit of a head, ahead of the game for, in most states. Uh, but before the 2016 election, we had worked with a uh, Department of Defense clearance, independent third party vendor to conduct a cyber hygiene scan of all of our digital systems. That included a risk and vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. This summer, we actually implemented two-factor authentication for anyone, whether it be my own staff or uh, the town clerks who have to get into access our election management system. Plus, we've had secure the human cyber, excuse me, cyber training. Um, in April of 2018, we completed an additional round of penetration tests uh, ahead of the uh, election. Uh, and the report was that our system was mature and well defended. And the only recommendation identified with, uh, <coughs> was two-factor authentication, which we had already been in process to implement. Um, other things that we've done to protect our systems. Uh, we have uh, every one of our IT solutions that we use have been replaced since 2012. Just because of that, we have better IT. That means it's stronger cybersecurity. We also have weekly hygiene scans from the Department of Homeland Security. We have uh, web application firewalls in front of every door in our system. We have, uh, we're members of the MS ISAC, which, and they provided us a Albert monitor that monitors internet traffic as it's approaching us through our, in front of our WAFs. Uh, we blacklist any known or suspected terrorists uh, or problem IP addresses. Uh, we, we do a daily backup of our voter registration database so even if someone were to break into our database, uh, we could go back 24 hours and restore it, uh, just losing really one, one day's worth of uh, data. But because we also have the same day voter registration here in Vermont, it gives us a, it's a, another great uh, best practice. It protects voters to make sure that they can vote in the, in the election. Uh, we've worked hard to establish great relationships with the media and other partners as well. Uh, we get out reliable uh, and credible info to the public. Uh, we, we work through NAS, our, our association. We have, a, uh, we have a direct pipeline to Twitter and Facebook to record any attempts that we see uh, sp of spreading misinformation or disinformation. Uh, and I could go on and on and on and talk, but this is, like I said, a very top priority for us. Uh, we are preparing for the worst. We don't prepare in hopes that we, we uh, that it doesn't happen. We prepare as if it will happen. That way we're ready for it when it does. If there's one takeaway from all of this, we're doing everything we can to protect our elections. Voters should feel confident going to the polls that their vote is secure and will be counted. The real intent of the 2016 Russian attacks 
wasn't to actually cause damage, but to sow chaos and discord and weaken voter confidence. Briefly, just as important is to protect every vote that's cast and ensuring that every eligible voter who wants to cast a ballot can. Unprecedented attacks on voter rights and access in recent history. We need to make sure we keep moving forward. It is easy to make it easier for people to vote, harder for people to cheat. You can hear a lot of talk about voter fraud. Let me just say my opinion on what is the true voter fraud. It's denying any eligible voter the right to cast a ballot. So remember, your vote is your voice. It's your constitutional right to know, to have that voice heard. And I will now turn it back over to you, Dan, and uh, we'll open it up for questions. Great, thank you, Secretary Condos. And I'd like to remind folks who are on the webinar with us that um, there is a uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, click that and you can ask a question and uh, we will re review them on our uh, computers and then ask uh, Secretary Condos or anyone else on the panel if you have a question for them. Um, Secretary Condos, um, you know, one thing that I hear a lot from folks when they're talking about potential uh, hacking of our elections is there seems to be some confusion about whether or not uh, the potential hacking could change vote outcomes or just simply get into the system to see, you know, voter rolls and voter registration. Can you talk about that a bit uh, and maybe, you know, how that would impact Vermont and, and whereas other, how that impact other states as well? So, um, first of all, what happened in 2016, not one vote was changed. Um, and I can say that it would be very difficult to change change actual votes because most of the, the tabulators across the country are not connected to the internet. That's the other beauty of having a paper ballot. With a paper ballot, you and, and when I say a paper ballot, it's not just a paper trail, but a voter marked paper ballot where the voter actually marks the ballot, can see what they made for choices before they put it into the tabulator. Um, and then as, as we do here in Vermont with uh, post-election audits, we actually do 5% of our towns. We do 100% of the census of the ballots in that bag, as well as 100% of the races. So we're not just picking one or two races and a few towns. We actually do every ballot in that bag from that town and every race that's on that ballot. We've never seen a discrepancy. Um, we've also had numerous recounts that also reconfirm uh, that the, the totals are correct. As far as, uh, you know, one of the concerns have been about election night reporting sites. The election night reporting sites are on one side of the, of the systems. Um, we, it, for us, it, it doesn't actually have a connection to the, the uh, tabulation side. What it does do is it, the tabulation side will create a, a, um, a, a, a sh small database that it uploads into the election night reporting site, uh, but that's all protected and, and, and sequestered off as well. Um, we're also monitoring it. So even if we started to see some wild swings occur, we would be able to move in quickly. We also passed in Vermont, we passed legislation this past year and Dan and Ashley, you might remember, uh, that gives me the authority if I suspect that we've been, we're under attack, uh, I can actually shut down all the uh, 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 equipment, essentially, and order a, a paper count, a, a, a hand count. So we put in, you know, we've got re re redundancies and resiliencies in place. Uh, and we hope that we don't have to enact those. Great. Uh, thank you. And we have uh, one question from Richard uh, for Secretary Condos. Um, how common are these best practices that you've discussed uh, in other states across the country and what prevents all states from implementing these safeguards? Well, each state would have to take their own, uh, would have to make their own, uh, act, take their own actions to implement them. I would say that, I, I can't say a, a majority of states, I don't know how, I, I really don't have, have that information, but I would say that's one of the goals that I'm hoping we have never, as, as a national association, taken a position of best practices. And that's mainly because we have 50 states out there. But I'm looking to see how we can do um, a, a, a limited list of best practices, which I think should be in, enacted. You know, currently there are only a, a, about 10 states overall, about five that actually are totally statewide using what they call touchscreen technology. Just remember that the touchscreen technology came about 
as a result of the hanging Chad debacle back in 2002. So that that first round of money that everybody got, they went out, a lot of those states went out and bought touchscreen technology. It was considered the, the latest and the best. Today we know different, and I think most states are already moving in the other direction, back to, back to uh, paper ballots and, and post-election audits. Just to give you an example, the governors of both Virginia and Pennsylvania by executive order ordered paper ballots to be uh, implemented where they had touchscreen technology. The state of New Jersey uh, uh, was using, and I think is still using uh, touchscreen technology, but uh, uh, they, they just had a passage this summer uh, of new legislation. But as I said before, it's not like walking into Best Buy and, and saying, I want 200 of these machines. Uh, you, ha you have to order it, you have to go through a, a process, and every state has a different procurement process. Dan, if I could also, I wanted to add a little color with a, a story. I don't know all, all the details off the top of my head, but we just had a meeting last week uh, that involved some other election security advocates, and they told us a story about a very small race in a small town, and uh, the person who lost the race um, this is in New Jersey, actually, I believe, and they were using DREs, so it was all directly recorded into a computer, no paper involved. And after the race, the loser looked at the counts and said, I have a number of friends and colleagues that I know were going to vote for me who said that they voted for me that's larger than the number of votes I received. And so uh, that individual uh, created a, a lawsuit and actually had affidavits from all these people who voted for him that was larger than the vote tally to sh show like they're somehow votes are missing. And of course, at that stage, what do you do? Because you don't have paper, how do you reconstruct an election? Are you gonna hold the election again? That doesn't seem necessarily right or fair, but also have pretty great evidence that the results were wrong. Um, a difficult to say too, was did something malicious? Was there a malicious actor? Or was it just simply a software bug? Was there something that a poll worker did? They clicked the wrong thing, they pushed the wrong thing? Impossible to know. And so that's why things like paper, as primitive as it may seem, is such a compelling, um, simple way to solve these problems. We had a county here in California that decided they wanted to have more open uh, elections and what they did, you know, they, they were stuck with the equipment that they have and they didn't have touch screens. They actually were using paper ballots and what they, but those were all electronically tabulated. So what they did was after the election, they scanned all of those ballots. Um, so, you know, they're anonymized. So all the ballots got scanned and they said, Hey, if you want to see every single ballot that we counted, uh, it's on a DVD, come down to the secretary of state office or sorry, there's a county, a county uh, board of elections and we'll give you a DVD that includes every, every ballot. And so some people took them up on that and they did their own audit and they found a hundred and some missing votes. And what it turned out was the, the people making the, the company, making the tabulation, uh, hardware and software had a bug and they knew about the bug, but they hadn't fixed it yet. So these kinds of remarkable little things. Now that didn't change election results in that case. It was a very small number in a, in a county with a reasonable number of people. But when you start to hear about those kinds of stories, it doesn't even have to be a malicious actor in another country. Things can happen here on the basis of simple human error um, you know, or, or computer bugs. After working in technology for 20 years, I will tell you there is no software without bugs. Uh, it does not exist. So um, I just wanted to add a couple stories there that I think really help elucidate why paper and why audits. Great, so, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. I, I don't agree with you, Sarah. And, and frankly, um, this is why we, we advocate for a voter marked paper ballot, not just a paper trail, a voter marked paper ballot, uh, because that way we do have a record, you know, in, in, across the country on, on federal elections, the general election, we're required, our town clerks are required to seal those ballots and keep them for 22 months in case there's any challenge. So after 22 months, they can be destroyed, but, but up to that point, they have to be saved in case there is a challenge. We also have uh, a court process uh, that if someone wanted to challenge it and have, like for instance, in the example you used, uh, they, they could go to the court and have the court order a new election. We had a similar case it was, uh, uh, we had a case where this year, uh, the, after our primary, where a, uh, a recount actually ended up with a tie vote between uh, the two candidates and the judge ordered a, a, a 
a, 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 a new election to resolve that issue. Um, so, you know, and, and if you go back, hand count, a lot of people think hand count is, is the way to go too. Uh, and I can tell you that we have found the most discrepancies that come from hand counts. It's uncanny, but the human eye does make mistakes, especially when you're tired. We had a race, in, and Dan, you might remember this, back in 2006, it was a statewide race. There was a quarter of a million ballots cast uh, between a Democrat and a Republican for a state auditor. The re incumbent Republican won on election night by about 180 votes. The Democratic challenger challenged and said, I want a recount. After the recount, the Democratic challenger won by about 180 votes. What we found was 15 hand count towns, small towns, had made errors that added up to that 300 vote swing. And we have another question for Secretary Condos. Uh, this is from Mark. Uh, and we're going to get a little wonky here, so I apologize to some other folks. Uh, can you elaborate on your concerns about overly prescriptive audit, requir audit requirements and how those can be addressed while getting effective audits around the country? So I, I guess simply put, let me, let me just say that I think the, audit, the audits that we do should be audits that have a high statistical confidence level. Um, there are things like... Uh, 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 risk limited audits that are out there, and that's one type of an audit. Uh, we have a system, uh, we are the audit system that we use is a little bit different from a risk limited audit, but it actually offers equal to or even better uh, uh, confidence level and in, in, in statistical confidence level. And that's really what we're looking for is a statistical high level of uh, statistical confidence that the votes that were, uh, the, the tallies as they came in were accurate. And it is important that we use, that we have that because it does uh, deal with the integrity of our elections and the attitudes that the public has, the, the attitudes that our businesses have, because it is so important. Great, thank you, Secretary Condos. And you know, one question I always have is around, um, uh, we can debate the policies around uh, uh, open and fair elections, um, but often these conversations do come down to money and who's paying for what. Can you discuss uh, how elections on the state level are funded um, and what participation in financing you get from the federal government for some of these initiatives? So uh, here in Vermont, um, we, we still have, we have one of the smallest election teams, state election teams in the country. Uh, we have five members of our election team. Uh, and that includes the director. Uh, but we, we were fortunate from our original uh, Help America Vote Act money to still have some of that money left. So we've been able to uh, in, in implement several fact, uh, several uh, uh, good pro pro programs. Um, and, and part of that was our complete new election management system. Uh, and we and we also budgeted for it as well when we go to the legislature. So uh, there are different systems that we put in place. Uh, for instance, this summer we added a new uh, accessible voting system uh, that allows anybody with a, a uh, uh, with a, a physical impairment to be able to vote independently and privately. Uh, what we found out was the old system we had, which was an analog phone system. Uh, people just were not using it. And uh, literally, uh, we'd have about 20 people across the state that would use it. We're hoping that with this new system, people can actually go to the polls and vote independently without asking for help. Uh, and it, it, it's fully ADA compliant. It's uh, one of the first, it's actually a ballot marking device that actually takes a regular ballot that we provide, puts, we put that ballot into the printer they make their choices on a tablet and then it prints on, it actually marks their ballot how they wanted it to vote. And they get to look at that ballot before they submit it to the tabulator. Great, thank you, Secretary Condos. And, you know, I'm also uh, hoping to talk about just kind of the, the Vermont culture around voting and democracy and participation in your communities. You know, we are the town meeting state. For those not from Vermont, you know, every March, uh, most of the state goes down to their local town hall and they actually have a town meeting where they debate issues and then they vote on them. 
And so there seems to be a culture of participating in elections, participating in democracy. Can you talk about that a, a little bit and how that impacts your job? Sure. So uh, first of all, my role as, as the chief elections officer and, and my elections team, we provide a lot of, uh, I'll use the word oversight, but we don't actually have authority over the town clerks. We can only help educate, answer questions, uh, and assist them with uh, the equipment and uh, uh, purchasing of ballots and whatever. But the, the system that we have, like as you described, the, the town meeting, is where we actually bring it back to uh, the individual's right to participate. And um, you, you can go to your town meeting on local issues and you can say, well, I think they ought to move $1,000 from the town, the highway budget over to the school budget. Uh, and, and if the voters say so, approve that, it's done. Um, when we, that's, that's for most of the smaller towns. So a lot of the larger towns are actually using what we call an Australian ballot, which is, is an actual paper ballot uh, that's pre-printed. Um, you don't have, when, when you have the Australian ballot, you actually don't have that option of being able to adjust budgets at the, at the level, at that local level. But we use the Australian ballot method at the, at the, uh, uh, the general election for our primary, which is in August, and then the general in November. Uh, and you know we we are constantly we use social media to get the word out about voting. We we issue press releases. We got uh, a, you we have a YouTube video about registration. Uh, we've made it easy for people to be able to register, whether they they, they do it uh, online or by paper. Uh, we have what we call it uh, our MVP page, which is a My Voter page. Every registered voter in the state of Vermont has a unique page that gives them their information, uh, where they live. Um, and you, if you need to make a change to that, you're able to make a change. Um, and then the system will automatically divert you. If, you, if you're going into a new polling district, will aut automatically send that information to the new uh, town clerk so that she can add you to their checklist. You get information on how to contact your checklist, your uh, town clerk, who, she, who she, he or she is, um, you, you can get a sample ballot from there. You can also order online uh, an absentee or early ballot uh, to be sent to you, and you can track it. You can track when it was ordered, when they sent it, when they received it back, and the status of that it was okay. Um, and that give, helps give people confidence that their, their earlier or, or absentee ballot was, was actually uh, voted and counted. Um, so, you know, we, we've tried to put as many of these measures in place to help people, you know, just our early voting period, whereas some, many states over the last, since 2010 have been trying to either eliminate, reduce uh, early voting periods. In 2009, when the early, the uh, UACAVA or Overseas and Military Vote Act passed in, in Congress to extend that ballots had to be ready and mailed out by the 45th day before the election, Vermont decided to extend their early vote period from 30 days out to 45 days for all Vermonters. So we have a lengthy time uh, for people to actually act, request a ballot and vote. And I think it shows, I mean, we've been getting about 30% um, uh, participation from early votes uh, in, in, in the last presidential election we had 68% of our registered voters uh, that actually voted, uh, and that's in the upper percentile of, of states. I think that the highest state was either Minnesota, I forget, I think it was Minnesota that w had about 74%. Well, we'll gun for them, we'll beat them, whoever they are. So. We're gunning for it. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask uh, Sarah a question next. Um, you know, I'm hearing a lot about uh, how technology is changing voting, uh, you know, blockchain voting, uh, voting from iPhones. Uh, Sarah, is this something that uh, Business for America will be looking at or has a position on right now? Certainly looking at it. Uh, as you might imagine, I uh, live in San Francisco, work in Silicon Valley for so long, and I get this question a lot when we are at conferences, when am I going to be able to vote from my iPhone? And uh, it's a good question. Uh, right now, our view is that the technology is not quite there yet. 
there are places, um, there are other countries that are farther along with use of blockchain and government and elections. Um, here in the States, there is a pilot going on in West Virginia to try out blockchain um, and mobile voting. So we'll see how that goes. So something definitely worth watching. Um, for now though, you know, we see a bigger issue not being the convenience. I mean, certainly would love for it to be easier for people to participate um, in, in the elections, but we think the trust issue is even greater. And with the paper ballots that we were talking about before, you know, you can validate that your vote was captured correctly when you hand that over to the poll worker or what have you, you know it's, it's correct and that there's this paper trail. So in our view, we need to walk before we can run and having elections where we have this high degree of confidence that they're accurate is gonna be the most important thing over the shorter term. Over the longer term, uh, when the technology is there, um, definitely is a possibility that we could see um, more mobile uh, technology driven voting opportunities. And actually, I should mention, um, the United States government does actually use uh, digital mobile voting um, for some of its overseas uh, military. Hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Secretary Condos, any thoughts on voting from the iPhone? Um, I kind of agree with what Sarah just said. And I, I, I actually don't think it's going to happen before I'm out of this office, uh, whenever that is. And, and uh, uh, I think it's something... Think we have to look at it, uh, but again, if we if we go in that direction, we have to change our state law, which requires a paper ballot. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, even with blockchain, I'm I'm a, I'm a believer that blockchain has its uh, uh, benefits, uh, but I'm not sure. Even some of the experts at the Harvard Belfer, Belfer Center have said that it's we're not ready for that yet, and we're we're going to be anxious to see what happens in West Virginia. Uh, they're using it for their, mainly for their overseas and military voters. Uh, we also are looking at how we can use our new uh, uh, accessible voting system, which allows you to actually mark a ballot from home. Uh, and we're thinking about trying to see if we can use that for overseas and military as well. So there is, there is you know, a lot of things going on. I, I, I guess here's what I would say about technology and how it's changing. It's changing really fast. I mean, it is, uh, if, if you go back to 2010, when I first was elected to today, eight years difference, uh, it's vastly different uh, technology wise. And the technology is changing really quick. It's evolving. Uh, there'll be a lot of things coming down the road as we go. Thank you, Secretary Condos. And uh, we just have a few minutes left. So one final question for you, Secretary. Uh, can you talk about one, uh, states that are doing 100% vote by mail? Uh, and is this kind of similar to absentee ballots that we're doing here in Vermont? It, it is. Uh, we, we actually consider ourselves to be a vote by mail because you can, you can request a ballot by mail uh, and you can fill it out and send it back in by mail. Uh, but that's just for that, uh, the early vote period. Um, so you have Oregon, Washington, and Colorado that are using um, vote by mail. Uh, and essentially what they do is they send a paper ballot uh, out to 100% of their voter checklist. Uh, that requires uh, a very accurate voter checklist to be maintained. Uh, and, and that in itself can be a problem as well, but, but it's been successful in all three. Uh, the state of Washington, I think, was the first state to use vote by mail, um, and and they've had very successful participation. Those three states have all have higher participation levels uh, in, in voter uh, actually voters who have participated. So um, I think it is got potential. Uh, we already, like I said, we're kind of a hybrid here in Vermont, uh, and uh, I think there are going to be some. Uh, there might be some legislation introduced this year to actually look at it. Um, there are some, believe it or not, there are actually added costs because you have to mail that out and there is a cost to mailing it when you're mailing it to 100% of your uh, voters, but uh, um, there's also benefits to it. Uh, great. And, uh, you know, I know I've, I've voted by absentee a few times when I'm going to be out of state or if I have a busy work day, but there's something I love about going down to the polls on election day. Uh, it's, an, it's a community experience, so I try to do that as much as possible. Um, I want to turn it over to uh, Sarah for some closing uh, statements. 
Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, really quickly before we go, wanted to talk a little bit about how people can get involved. So let me switch over here. So I want to talk quickly about uh, Business for America's plans for 2019. I mean, obviously with the elections going on and the holidays, um, we're going to continue to work on the Secure Elections Act over that period. And if we haven't gotten that passed yet, we're going to continue to work on that next year. And uh, who knows what the next legislature, the next Congress will look like um, and what the results will be. But we're also going to pick up other bills, other initiatives where we can help make a difference particularly at the state level where we're starting to see fertile grounds. Um, not a lot of work for us to do in Vermont, but uh, other states have lots of opportunities for us to engage and to bring the business voice to those debates. Um, so we're also wanting to align with the uh, thought leadership that we'd like to do. We're talking about setting up a national conference and have that conversation about business and democracy, you know, how our economy functions and how our government functions and how we get both of them optimized to work together and better serve all people and have a more robust business sector and economy. Um, and then that last thing there is I mentioned advocating in key states as we build up the, our constituency across the country, we're going to be able to do a lot more. We'll be able to have a bigger impact. Um, so folks, are, if you're wondering how you can get involved, we do have a letter to Congress right now on the Secure Elections Act. So you can add your voice as an individual business leader. As a, We're also adding business groups. Business organizations have signed on, uh, including VBSR. And we're also um, asking folks to get involved in helping advance things that you're in your state. Um, we can let you know where we've got teams growing and help slot you into the right place, introduce you to folks and figure out how we can uh, leverage your time and energy to make a difference. Also in Business for America, we have a third thing here. We have some working groups to, to help grow our organization and uh, increase the impact that we can, can make. So if you get in touch with us, we're at bfa.us. Uh, Email is really simple, info at bfa.us, easy to get a hold of us. And we'd love to have that conversation about what you'd like to do, what skills you have, um, and how much time you've got, and how you'd like to help us uh, strengthen democracy in America and help ensure the integrity of our elections. So please get in touch with us. Um, and with that, Dan, I'll hand it back to you. Great, thanks, Sarah. And uh, this brings us to the conclusion of the webinar. I want to thank uh, Vermont Secretary of State Jim Condos for his time and uh, his dedication to these issues. Uh, also, like to thank Sarah at Business for America and Ashley over at Main Street Alliance of Vermont uh, for uh, joining us on this call today. And we're going to keep on working on this issue and advancing the business case for reforming how we do elections in the United States. And looking forward to uh, continuing this conversation down the road. Thank you, everyone.